Last time on the Discover the Word podcast, the group began a two-part study of how, in so many ways, John the Baptist lived a life that pointed to Jesus. As we open up our scriptures, we're going to spend 10 conversations on one unique life that in all of the roles that he occupied on this planet, in every single one of them, he lived a life that pointed to Jesus. Yeah, Lisa Morgan guiding Marta Hahn and Bill Crowder and Daniel Ryan Day in exploring these 10 roles that help us understand what it looked like for John the Baptist to live a life that pointed to Jesus and what it might look like for us to live that kind of life. Well, we covered five of the 10 in our last podcast. And so this time we come to a sixth role that characterized the story of John the Baptist's life. He was a witness. So pull your chair up to the table with the group as we begin part two of this study of a life that points to Jesus with a helpful conversation about witnessing on Discover the Word. And welcome to Discover the Word, the Bible engagement effort of Our Daily Bread Ministries that is structured a lot like a small group Bible study in which friends explore the scriptures together in community. And as we get set for part two of this study called A Life That Points to Jesus, remember that in part one, we talked about how John the Baptist was a chosen child. He grew up into a unique individual, to say the least. He was a forerunner of Jesus. He was the Baptist, John the Baptizer. And he was a prophet. And all those things about John pointed to Jesus. And I think we were challenged to think about, you know, where the arrows of our life are pointing. Are we pointing to Jesus? Well, in this episode, we will find five more roles that John had. And so in this first segment, Elisa wants Mart and Bill and Daniel to think about how John lived into the role of witness and how in doing that, he pointed people to Jesus. So can you think of a time when you sensed God nudging you to be a witness for him? And I'm using that word really intentionally here. Yeah, I struggle to answer that question because growing up, there was so much pressure around witnessing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that I don't know that I can go back and think clearly about what was a situation where it really was God nudging me Mm -hmm. and what was a situation where it was just all that baggage that I was carrying where I felt like I always had to witness. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's confusing for me. Yeah. The only thing I remember, there have been probably any number of times when I really cared about someone and they were going through difficult times and I knew if there was some way of giving Mm -hmm. them something to rely on, if there was any way of letting them know that there is, there is a God who cares. And I remember I would, I would often pray and just say, Lord, is would you just give me some opportunity or enable us to have a good conversation? And looking back, I often think, oh, good night, it happened. Mm. It happened kind of naturally, you know. And, you know, Daniel, I kind of came up through a similar school of thought as you did where there was a lot of pressure. In fact, we had a class in Bible college on personal evangelism, and it was homework to go out and knock on people's doors and share your faith with them. That was rough, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard. that's hard work. Or to go down to the bus station and preach to the people who are there waiting for their bus. And one of the verses that they used is you have to always be ready to give an answer. And it was only years <laughs> later when I was really studying that text that I came to realize that's only half the story. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, we are to always be ready to give an answer, but we're not always be ready to shove that answer down somebody's throat necessarily because Peter says, always ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you of the hope that is within you, Mm. which seems to me to be saying my primary responsibility is to live a life of confident hope in my God so that people who don't have hope will come and say, where do you get that? How does that work? I appreciate that, Bill, because so many times I I remember that verse and I think of, I need to have apologetics at my fingertips. And it's not my forte. I mean, it is some people's forte and and intellectual belief is important to many people. But to really think about the hope, you know, why do I have hope? And I I remember making a new friend. I I was in my 60s and we were on a walk and we were just talking about our lives. 
And she said, why was faith so important to you? Mm. And I, I was just taken aback by it because it was such an honest, raw, ground level question. And it made me, like you were saying, Mart, to go back and go, well, how do I express this? Because I know she, she had lost a son. I know she was looking for hope as well. Mm. And it made me go, how do I convey that? And yet, even the fact that she would ask me that question revealed something about my life that expressed faith. And maybe that's more the point. And when we think of this word witness, sure, we need to have words, you know, at times. But are we witnessing and pointing to Jesus, pointing to God's work in our world, pointing to his character? We've been talking about John the Baptist and the different roles that he played. It's like a, an on-ramp to understand this very interesting character in Scripture, you know, as a chosen child and a unique man and a, a prophet and, you know, all these things we've been looking at. And one of the, the words I think that can describe him, too, is he pointed, he lived a life that pointed to Jesus as he was a witness in a certain way. In fact, I want to just read a verse from John chapter 5, verses 31 to 35-ish. Jesus says, If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There's another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you might be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. There's a way in which Jesus is saying himself, John testified to me. John witnessed to me. John lived a life that pointed to me. He was a lamp that burned and gave light. That's, I think, maybe something we're encouraged to do. But there are a couple of ways I want us to go back and, and dip into John's story and see, how did he point others to Jesus by being a witness, by testifying, by how he lived? Let's look at a couple of spots in Matthew chapter 3. Daniel, would you get verses 1 to 2? Sure. And then, um, Mark, could you get verses 7 to 10? All right. Okay. Matthew 3, 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Okay, we don't see Jesus specifically mentioned here. What phrase do we see that does connect to God? Well, the kingdom of heaven, and it also connects to Jesus because in two chapters, Jesus is going to preach the Sermon on the Mount and describe the kingdom of heaven a whole lot. A whole lot, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he, and he, and also the fact that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Why? Well, because the king has arrived. Yeah. Jesus yeah. is the king. And so there's a kind of a backdoor reference yes. to Jesus, not a in your face reference to Jesus. Yeah, you almost have to put the whole story together, don't you? Yeah, he was good. he was anticipating one who's going to come. The people sensed his Messiah coming. Mm -hmm. So there was a there was a way in which he was mm -hmm. pointing them forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And John ends up missing most of Jesus' life. Yeah. Right? So right. there is an, a sense in which every time we hear from John, he couldn't have the whole story yet yeah. because it hadn't unfolded yet. It kind of, it kind of reinforces yeah. what we were saying before. As long as we're pointing in the direction yeah. of mm -hmm. what we have seen mm -hmm. and where we have gotten hope. Yeah. And, and how of, comforting, too, is that we'll never have the whole picture. I mean, just yeah. like John lived 30 years or so and missed most of Jesus's earthly ministry, you know, we don't understand the whole yeah. picture either. We share from what we do understand. Well, and I think part of the challenge that we face in our generation is we live in such an informationally oriented world that we're always looking for the right formula or the right data yeah. or the right piece of information. What I find very liberating is the story of the man born blind in John 9. When they start drilling down into his theology, yeah. he says, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if he was good or bad. All I know is I used to be blind and now I see. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's very liberating. It is. Because we don't have to have all the answers. But what have we seen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What have we seen? Us. Yeah. So John's pointing all people in general. And yeah. then in, in uh, Matthew 3, 7 to 10, we're going to see him point some specific people to Jesus. And and maybe just read the verse 7, Mart, because we've talked about this section of Scripture before in other conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, and he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he's pointing the Pharisees and the Sadducees mm-hmm. to Jesus. I'm floored by Mark 6, which tells the story, and we're going to cover it in the next conversation or two, about Herod. And in verse 20, Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, and yet he liked to listen to him. He probably liked it more than the Pharisees did. (laughs) (laughs) So John's obviously pointing Herod in some way to Jesus, and that's Mm -hmm. going to be a a story with a long tail. Okay, then let's look at John chapter 1, and let's listen for how John pointed to Jesus in terms of what he said about him. Let's just go around the table, Daniel, if you'd start us off. Sure. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, saying, I have beheld the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. And I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Wow. Read that again, Bill. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. In Mm. verse 35, Mark. Yeah, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. There's something really significant in this passage about that concept of witnessing. And we've been talking about how you don't necessarily have to use words. You don't have to understand it all. You know, you can point to the way of Jesus, the character of God. But John really specifically in this passage says, this is the guy. I saw heavens Mm -hmm. open. I saw God declare. I saw, you know, this is what I've been called on the earth to to talk about. This is bold. Yeah. And it shows a bunch of different layers of what a witness is because it's someone who, in this moment, he declared who Jesus was, but he also witnesses to a situation, a context, a setting that he saw unfold a story. Mm He also witnesses to his own role, as you said. So it's like there's all these layers of witnessing to the work that God was doing and where he found himself in that story. Yeah, That really broadens our understanding of what it means to be a witness or to experience God's Mm -hmm. nudge. I mean, John pretty much unequivocally knew he was chosen to be a witness. I mean, Jesus himself says he was a lamp that burned and gave light. Mm I mean, that was his existence. Did he always use words? Did he always use water? (laughs) Did he always, you know, let people smell his camel hair coat? You know, the message of his life, the direction of the arrow that was his life pointed to Jesus. And he didn't even know where it was all going. (laughs) He didn't know how it was going to play out. But, But I think that's right. And I think what maybe you're driving at, Elisa, is that there was harmony between the message he spoke and the life that he lived. Mm -hmm. Those things matched up, and and nothing does greater harm to the message of Christ in any generation than when those who are presenting that message don't have a life that represents that message well. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say, too, on the other side of that, I bet for each of us we can also think of someone in our lives who exemplified the love of Christ in such a way. Mm-hmm that we were more drawn to it than ever before yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. And maybe yeah. we eventually realized that, yeah. mm-hmm. even though we didn't see how it all fit together at mm-hmm. the time. That's mm-hmm. right. I remember after the event at Columbine High School, one of my co-worker's son went to that school and he was a survivor. But she said, it's so bizarre. All different kinds of people that I've only met in passing are calling or showing up on our doorstep. And she began to realize it's just because they knew God. And she said, I I discovered that it's just pretty much like moths are attracted to a light in the dark. Uh And, you know, John was God's lamp burning. You know, he attracted, sometimes weirdly, but he always (laughs) attracted and pointed to Jesus. Mm, Great start to part two of this study about John the Baptist and his life that pointed to Jesus. He was a witness. 
And so how might you shape your actions as a lamp for Jesus? You never know who might end up being attracted to Jesus when you're being a light. And that kind of puts a different spin on witnessing, doesn't it? Well, have you ever heard the saying, always a bridesmaid, never a bride? You know where that saying came from? I think you'd be surprised because actually it was the slogan of an ad campaign for mouthwash. Seriously, Uh, Listerine in 1925 used often a bridesmaid, never a bride as a slogan for a print ad campaign. Now, apparently bad breath was identified as a cause for not getting married. And that perspective turned into a proverb sounding saying that many still say today that maintain it's better to be a bride than a bridesmaid. Well, as we continue our look at the life of John the Baptist, we discover that he didn't buy into that kind of so-called wisdom. He lived a life in direct opposition to the idea that it was a negative to, you know, flipping it over to the men's side, always be a groomsman, never a groom. Continue to explore with us how this helps us understand why John the Baptist lived a life that pointed to Jesus. Have you guys ever been in a wedding, not your own, you know, but, you know, yeah. served in a wedding in some capacity? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah? I have yeah. too, yeah. What roles? I've officiated. I've uh-huh. been a groomsman. Uh-huh. The most difficult role was to take care of all the kids while uh-huh. my wife and her sisters were in a wedding. I remember wrangling my three-year-old grandson into his little itty-bitty tux with his itty-bitty vest and the itty-bitty suspenders because he was going to be the ring bearer or something, you know. Oh, so much work. Uh-huh. I saw a post on Instagram the other day where this girl decided for her wedding, instead of having a flower girl, she was going to have her flower grandpa. Oh, how cute is and that? And her grandpa came in on her arm throwing flowers out in front of her. <laughs> it was the coolest thing ever. I love that. That's what you want to be now, right? <laughs> okay, Mark, you're being really quiet. Have you been a groomsman or something? Not a groomsman. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I've officiated a few, mm-hmm. but my parents showed me a picture. I was a ring bearer uh, when I was four. Perfect. <laughs> that little suit had head on. Yeah. Don't remember yeah. that. Don't yeah. remember that, no. And being a matron of honor or a maid of honor or a bridesmaid, I think we girls kind of can overdo the wedding thing. Uh, it's enormous mm-hmm. responsibility. I think maybe for the, the best man and the maid or matron of honor, those roles are deep with yeah. lists, mm-hmm. checklists of what yeah, you're yeah. supposed to do. Yeah. Chief of which is like guarding the rings or you know, taking stress off of the couple, those kinds of deals. Uh, attendants are big. John the Baptist it, it uses an analogy about a wedding mm-hmm. when he describes one of his roles in pointing to him. And it's this role of attendant. It's almost like the best man. It really is. Yeah. Before we go to that passage, which is in John 3, I want to set us up by looking at John's overall demeanor as an attendant pointing to Jesus. Let's just grab a couple of texts, Matthew three eleven, Mart, if you could get that, and then Bill, Matthew three thirteen to 14, and let's just read them. Matthew three eleven, John says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. And he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay, so he's pointing out the difference between himself and Jesus. What do you see there? How does he characterize himself? Well, he's putting himself as like the lowest of servants. Mm -hmm. After me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. That is so vivid. And if we remember the story of Jesus washing Peter's feet, Mm -hmm. you know, Jesus is taking that role of servant Mm -hmm. to his own disciple. John's saying, I'm not even worthy of doing that. So it's a positioning of himself. Then in Matthew 3, 13 to 15, we've looked lightly at this interaction, but let's think about it in this context of John being an attendant. Who has that? I've got it. Okay. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, 
Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Okay, so again, his position, he's humbling himself, saying, I'm not worthy to baptize you. You need to baptize me. Mm -hmm. And how do you net that out? Yeah, potentially tied to the idea of repentance, Mm -hmm. that um, the baptism that John is doing is a a baptism of repenting for the broken things in us, the mistakes we make, the sins we commit. And the baptism represents this being cleansed of that. And so John, as this representative of God, is like symbolically the one, you know, maybe dipping people in the water so that they come out clean. So the idea of Jesus coming to him and saying, I need to be baptized by you. John's like, nope, yeah, <laughs> that's no way. not how right. this works. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. I'm not worthy to carry yeah. your sandals. I need you to yeah. get the sin off me, not yeah. the other way around. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now let's go into this text that I was foreshadowing as we began our conversation. This is in John chapter three, and we're going to read 22 to 30. This is after Nicodemus. Let's listen for the metaphor that John uses. Mark, do you want to start us? Okay. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John was also baptizing near Anon, near Salim, because there was plenty of water. People were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone is going to him. Okay, let's pause for a minute. What's going on in this situation? You've got two groups. Everybody's being baptized. So now an argument breaks out. And what's the gist of the argument? What's the struggle here? Something about ceremonial washing, okay, which was a big deal to the Jews yeah. as a part of the ritual cult of Judaism. I mean, not just washing of the body, but washing of household utensils, washing of everything. Everything was subjected to ceremonial cleansings. But the specific words, the, the argument in verse 26, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan... The one you testified about, there's that word again. Look, he's baptizing and everyone's going to him. What do you think they're worried about? John losing his following. Mm -hmm. That's at least part of it. But Mm -hmm. there's also kind of a a reversal that's happened because you have a, you know, John baptizes Jesus. And then all of a sudden that group is the one baptizing. There's been kind of like a baton passing almost, you know, a passing of the mantle. Now, how does John respond? Let's go ahead and pick it up again at verse 27. Mart, would you continue? To this, John replied, a person can receive only what's given to them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I'm not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. Well, that joy is mine, and it's now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. Not even worthy of carrying his sandals. But here's this beautiful metaphor of bride, bridegroom, attendant. What do you take from it? Well, I think John knew that in spite of his I think, genuine humility that he'd been given a very special role. And that's why you can say my joy is now complete. You know, I mean, this is what I've been living for my whole life Mm -hmm. uh, is to see this happening. Yeah. In fact, in verse 27, a person can only receive what is given them from heaven. You know, in terms of being a chosen child, this is his role to be an attendant. As I've studied a tiny bit about weddings in New Testament Mm -hmm. times, the attendant played a very specific role of guarding the bride or the bridegroom. So it's like John is saying, the friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy because she's been kept aside to be kept pure. The bridegroom comes and knocks on the door wherever she is, and it's only the attendant Mm -hmm. who lets it in. How does that illustration help us understand that John's life is pointing to Jesus as an attendant. Well, mostly by making it clear that he himself is not the bridegroom. I'm not the Messiah. I'm just preparing the way. And I think I'm just caught up with is full of joy. That joy is mine. That joy is complete. Mm -hmm. There's like this excitement and overwhelming 
emotional high mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. that John mm-hmm. is referring to here. You just get the sense that John's embodying all of that in this little parable that he yeah. tells. That that's his joy to see Jesus come into the world and for people to be noticing Jesus and following Jesus. Nothing brings him more joy to, mm-hmm. than to see that happening. Yeah. And it's apparent that God has given John that insight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as a result of that insight, he's expressing great joy. And other mm-hmm. people then can see John's joy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which would then give them reason to say, wait a minute, what's John seeing in this person, mm-hmm. Jesus? Mm-hmm. What fulfillment of his role as an attendant? And the last line, oh, it's one of my favorite lines in scripture, is that he must become more, I must become less. That mm-hmm. whole. Yeah, I remember Haddon Robinson often praying that before he spoke, you know, may I become less as you become mm-hmm. more. And, you know, that's really the whole direction of John's life is, in matter of fact, pretty soon he's going to die and he's going to go out of the picture altogether. So this contest of who's the best, John sets people clear of... Jesus is the deal. He's the greater. I'm going to become less. And guess what? Pretty soon I'm going to be gone. (laughs) It's pretty much what happens here as in an attendant role. He lives out his destiny, honestly, pointing his life to Jesus. What a great image that is of John being like an attendant at a wedding and how that fed into his he must become more while we become less attitude. And uh, we'll spend more time on that attitude later in this episode because that's really what a life fully pointed at Jesus is all about. You're listening to Discover the Word, and this is part two of our exploration of the life of someone who had uh, quite the reputation from chosen child to baptizer to prophet to witness to attendant. We're discovering how in all these different roles he lived a life that points to Jesus. And I think we're being challenged to think about how we might do the same. Well, next, we're going to see how John the Baptist could also have been called John the Questioner. But first, this quick time out. Now, Discover the Word is part of a larger Bible engagement ministry, Our Daily Bread Ministries, that in a lot of ways is following the model of pointing to Jesus. We have a variety of audio podcasts and video resources, as well as print and internet resources like the Our Daily Bread devotional. And during this series, tracking the story of John the Baptist through the Gospels, I'm taking the opportunity to tell you about some of the video work that our friend Dr. Jack Beck has done, showing how geography and place are an important aspect of understanding the message of the Bible. Jack has been with us a number of times here on Discover the Word, and so we consider him, you know, our Bible geography expert. And he does such a great job of making the geography of the Bible meaningful. And he's done several video series with Our Daily Bread Ministries that demonstrate how place is always a piece of every story, including yours. So watch the Along the Road series, and I think you'll get hooked and want to watch more. Go online to Our Daily Bread Ministries YouTube channel by typing Our Daily Bread YouTube along the road into your browser's search bar. Again, search Our Daily Bread YouTube along the road. All right, so next, let's see a couple of times when John the Baptist was John the Questioner. You know, there are times when I question is just bubbling up inside me, and I just am not sure if I should ask it, you know, like, like there are times when we're sitting around this table mm-hmm. and, you know, I, I want to ask a question, but I think, oh, I'm going to look so dumb if I ask this question right now. And sometimes I just go, well, that's the point, Elisa, ask the question because <laughs> everybody else is wondering too, but do y'all struggle with that? Oh yeah. Yeah. Not uh-huh. wanting to look dumb. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think that's human. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I went right there too. Yeah. yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it was a very familiar feeling. It yeah. is. It is. I've always kind of struggled with that. And I think part of it for me is I, I function under the assumption that I'm supposed to know. Yeah. yeah. And maybe maybe dumb is a little uh-huh. harsh because I think sometimes we don't ask a question because we don't want to be misunderstood as well. Yeah. Right? Like there's times when you want to ask something, but you're like, I don't want them to think that I'm in this group. Oh, that's good. Or thinking about it this way mm-hmm. or something. So sometimes we don't ask questions because we don't want people to assume things about us too. Yeah. I think there's something really there too, Daniel. The questions we ask reveal something about ourselves to Mm -hmm. others. It may be a lack of knowledge. It may be uh, curiosity, Mm -hmm. simply that. 
But it might be revealing more the state of our heart or mm. our emotions or something from our past. You know, those, I think, questions, they're a vulnerable position. John the Baptist was a questioner. It's another role that he occupied. And anytime I see a person in league with Jesus, a person who lived a whole life that pointed to Jesus, like John or like some of his disciples, I'm always intrigued that they ask questions. And I'm really intrigued about the questions they ask, the significance of them. Mm -hmm. It surprises me. We've done whole studies on the disciples asking questions, on Jesus asking questions. But as we've been looking at the life of John, I ran across a couple of passages where he asks questions. And even in his Hmm. role as a questioner, he points to Jesus. So I wanted to look at those couple of passages here. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. And there's going to be a question that you'll hear, and we'll struggle along with it. Bill, would you read that for us? Sure. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. I love that. Then yeah. John consented. Yeah. So it was an honest question, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. In our last conversation, we looked at the fact that John didn't even feel like he was competent or equipped to carry Jesus's sandals, mm-hmm. you know, which was an incredibly humble role. Mm-hmm. And, and now we see he's going, yeah, I'm not the one who should baptize you. Yeah. There's another passage that may be even more surprising. This is in Matthew 11, 1 through 6. Mm-hmm. Would you get that, Daniel? Yeah, I got that. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. John's in prison, and we've skipped over that. He was in prison. Why? Because Herod got very scared and frustrated about him and put him in prison, right? And we'll look at that in our next conversation a bit more. But he's in prison. Now, Anybody find this odd, this question that he asks? No, you don't at all. I don't find it odd at all. Okay. Because he's in prison. Okay. I mean, it seems fairly... Explain it to us. It seems to me kind of fairly human nature that as you've been leading us through, Elisa, his whole life has been toward this work of pointing people to Jesus. And now he's in prison. He's cut off. It's not hard to imagine discouragement and frustration and second guessing to where you say, what if I got it wrong? I'm Mm -hmm. supposed to be here to point to the Messiah. I mean, when you're alone and you're isolated, it's easy to have a lot of misgivings about Mm -hmm. yourself and what you do. Imagine how painful that question must have been. Yeah. 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 I think it's also encouraging a little bit to us, though, in some ways. The fact that he doubts in this moment, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, up to this point, everything about John feels unattainable <laughs> to us, right? Like he seems yeah. to be this, you know, superhero, so in touch with God's will. He says all the right things, does all the right things. This is pretty human, isn't it's it? It's pretty, pretty down to earth. And yeah. it just reminds us of like, even in our closest moments with God, there's moments where we doubt too, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. And I also wonder if it's a little bit of a hint, you know, Jesus's disciples that walked with him his whole ministry when Jesus dies and then rises again, the mm-hmm. beginning of Acts, they say, oh, now's when you're going to take the throne of Israel and be the mm-hmm. Messiah we expected. Even after all of that, they yeah. still didn't quite understand the type of king Jesus was and the type of kingdom he was bringing. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if John is like, you know, mm-hmm. as the forerunner, I thought I was going to be this like maybe military person in some way or some kind of leader that was going to help mm-hmm. Jesus take the throne and then keep the throne or something. So for him to end up in jail... And for it not to be going the way he expects, Mm -hmm. 
maybe there's some of that in there too. He's mm-hmm. just wondering, like, maybe I misunderstood what I thought of as Messiah, especially because of the way Jesus responds. It's yeah. a stunning question, you know, and, you know, Peter denies Christ, you know, Jonah just shakes his hand at God. I mean, we see, a, we see all kinds of human experiences of God mm-hmm. in scripture, and I'm very grateful for it. I get paused on the fact that John's standing in a river when the Spirit of God descends like a dove on top of Jesus or above Jesus and says, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased. And yet he goes to prison and sends word. Are you the guy? I love it. And I'm also disturbed by it. And it's because of my own humanity. I go, wow, look at the dramatic things God has allowed in my life, where he has shown up, where he's delivered me, where I could never, ever say it was anybody but God, you know, who was there. And yet, you know, I'll get in my dark closet Mm -hmm. and question. And let's look at how Jesus responds. In verse four, he says, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus responds, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. (gasps) Wow. I mean, Mm -hmm. what an amazing resume he's Mm -hmm. just shouted. And he's actually speaking to fulfilled prophecy. Just quickly, let's go to some of those. Bill, could you get Isaiah 35, 5 to 6? And let's just hear some of the ways what Jesus is saying, what they would have meant to John as, as he listened to those things. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be mm-hmm. unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb will shout for joy for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Araba. Okay. And then in Isaiah 61, 1, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. John's question (laughs) made it possible for Jesus to answer with authority from Scripture that would be familiar to those who are listening. There would be a link between, yeah. There's a link. There's a link. And that link also is reaffirmed in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus is in the synagogue at Capernaum and he quotes Isaiah and the prophecies of what Messiah would do. And he says, today Mm -hmm. in your presence, this is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. It is surprising, though, because you would expect Jesus to say, yes. <laughs> right? Their question. That's right. Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Yes. Well, he gives evidence but instead, instead of making a claim. Yeah. Yeah, so they couldn't just argue with his words. They had to now argue with the scriptures. Yeah. With the prophets. And yeah. with what they've seen and heard. Yeah. yeah. So John's role as questioner, even that, points to Jesus. You know, do you want me to to baptize you? What? Mm -hmm. And then, are you the one who is to come? Or should we look for another? Even these questions that appear to be out of line, or at least kind of off-putting and distracting, they go straight to the heart of the matter. They point to Jesus, and they point us to ask our questions of Jesus, too. And so what are the questions that you have that you may be avoiding or are too scared to ask? How might they actually be a way that Jesus desires to use to show himself to you and to others? Because, you know, we all have questions. There are things that don't make sense to us. I have a friend who said he lived most of his life on the sloping back of a question mark. But, you know, he's also a person I would consider one of the greatest people of faith that I know. And so we see that in John as well. He was a questioner, and yet he lived a life that pointed to Jesus. Well, here at Our Daily Bread Ministries and Discover the Word, we believe that asking a lot of questions can help make the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible understandable. And it is Discover the Word friends like you that help us keep exploring and engaging and being encouraged by Scripture. We can't thank you enough for helping us tell the story of Jesus to millions around the world. And if you're interested in partnering with us financially, head over to discovertheword.org and check out our different support options. Just click Donate there at discovertheword.org. 
Well, as we come down toward the end of this study called A Life That Points to Jesus, uh, we're going to talk about how John the Baptist's life ends, because death is or will be part of each of our stories. When you think about it, these statistics on death are pretty impressive. 100% of us die. But even though that is reality, talking about death is often difficult and uncomfortable. And in some ways, that's true about how John the Baptist died. So pull your chair up to the table with the group and be part of a conversation about how dying a death that pointed to Jesus was part of John the Baptist living a life that pointed to Jesus. I never really studied the martyrs of the faith much. I mean, a lot of y'all know I didn't really grow up in a strong Bible teaching church. Uh, Mm -hmm. They love God, and I learned to love God, but I didn't know some of the church history and stuff. Were martyrs or the heroes of the faith like that, who died for the cause of Christ, something you grew up with or learned about? We had the book, but I I have never been willing to read those accounts. You mean Fox's Book of Martyrs? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had access to it, but I would not... As a young person and as an adult, I just can't do it. Yeah, I would recommend people to read it, but go in knowing it is a very hard read. Yeah, I've, I've read some of those accounts. I think, I think as a kid, though, getting my hands on that book and reading it, I don't know how helpful that was. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would agree with that as a kid, yeah. Because well, I think was, the it almost, is, yeah. yeah, it almost pushed it into like, I don't know, the novel or movie sensationalized sensationalizing Mm -hmm. version and i don't know that i really got a sense of the suffering and the pain and all that that was really involved in so many of those stories that's right and i mean you know we're talking about history but voice of the martyrs today Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is reminding us that people are still dying for the name of jesus around the world and god is still doing and god is still 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 providing grace that's right in those moments Maybe the most familiar tale of a martyr that we know about is is from Acts and the stoning of Stephen. We read that. We've read that. We've discussed Mm -hmm. it and questioned it on Discover the Word. And even there, you watch God give him grace, or at least the way Luke reports it. So maybe that's a little bit familiar, but, you know, and I'm not great on church history again, Bill, but all but John, is that correct, of the disciples? We believe. We believe? Yeah, we believe that all of the disciples Mm -hmm. except John were Mm -hmm. martyred, Mm -hmm. that he appears to be the only one who died of old age. As we continue to look at the roles of John, John, we we call John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, yet another role is that of martyr. Mm -hmm. And it's contained right here in our scripture Mm -hmm. as well. I don't think most of us hold him up as thinking about, oh, martyrdom of John the Baptist, but he was martyred. The background here is that John rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because of his marriage to Herodias, who was Herod's brother's wife. John just called him out. And this is in Luke chapter 3. And in verse 20 of Luke 3, Herod had added this. This is the way Luke describes it to all the evil things he'd done. He locked John up in prison. Hmm. Okay, so that's where the last part of John's life takes. And, you know, we'd looked at John as a questioner. He sends his disciples from where he is in prison to ask Jesus, are you the one or should we look for somebody else? So the last part of his life, which isn't super long, he died around the age 30-ish, is spent from prison. Now, I want us to go into the, the more detailed telling of his martyrdom. And this is in Mark chapter 6, and we're going to read from verse 14 to 29, and let's just go around the table, okay? Um, Mark, would you start us? Okay, Mark 6. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Let's just (laughs) pause there. Herod's interested in John. Yeah. He's intrigued by John. He probably feels convicted by John. Probably didn't like to hear what John was saying about him and the marriage. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, which is probably why in the Matthew account, it talks mm-hmm. about Herod wanted to kill John. That's in verse five, yeah. Yeah, he, he's mixed up on what he wants to do with yeah. John. <laughs> but it says in the Matthew account, but he was afraid of the people because yeah. they considered John a prophet. So Herod's intrigued, he's curious, but he also is a people pleaser. Mm. Okay, now verse 21 of Mark, Bill. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. So she went and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In verse 26, Daniel, and let's listen for what else is going on inside of Herod. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Oh. Wow. That's so gruesome, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's you? not exactly a great mothering moment going no. on there. I want the head of John the Baptist. Yeah. I mean, that's... And don't you wonder if Herod had been drinking? Oh, yes. You know. At least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it was so out of yeah. sorts to it forget his beyond role. beyond his mixed feelings to a very gruesome yeah, you know, and outcome. it may be that Herodias sensed that mm-hmm. weakness in him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, right. she knew him pretty well. It's also an honor-shame thing, though, It too, totally right? is. Because mm-hmm. right in front of all these dinner guests, there you go. Yeah. he said, I'll do whatever you ask. Yeah. Pull that up. Uh, in fact, let's lay these verses next to each mm-hmm. other. Yeah, it says, because of his oaths mm-hmm. and his dinner guests. Good. Yeah. He didn't want to refuse her. And then back up in, in verse 21, on his birthday, he gave a banquet for his high officials military commanders, and the leading men oh, of Galilee. Uh, I mean, the deck is stacked Well, and, and the fact that it's the leading men of Galilee, where Jesus is from, mm-hmm. and where John would have had some impact in his ministry as well, it's, yeah. it's a tough day. You know, some commentators have suggested that this whole scene kind of mirrors what the passion of Christ will look like as he goes before the different authorities. I I think that's just interesting Mm -hmm. and something to think about. But Herod's weakness costs John his life. And look how the disciples respond in verse 29. Yeah, they hear about what happened and they come and take his body and lay it in a tomb. And then in the Matthew account in chapter 14... Verse 13, we get how Jesus responded. What did you see there, Bill? Well, in Matthew 14, verse 13, Mm -hmm. it says, Now when Jesus heard it, he withdrew from there in a boat to a lonely place by himself. And when the multitudes heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. And imagine how personally the disciples must have taken that too. Mm -hmm. And let's recall, as, as we pointed out, this is John is Jesus' cousin. His mother, Elizabeth, his father, Zechariah. We don't know how long they lived, but uh, this is family. And John was bigger than life Mm -hmm. to the other Mm -hmm. disciples as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, in the very first conversation, Elisa, you asked us to think about the dreams that we had for our kids when we were expecting our children. I guarantee you this wasn't part of their dream Mm -hmm. for John, Mm -hmm. that he was going to end up being executed by the king. No. Before Jesus was even executed. And I'm also struck by, in the Mark passage, this telling of this horrific act is sandwiched between Jesus sending out the 12 and feeding the 5,000. And it's just right in there, just kind of Mm -hmm. as life goes along. And isn't that how it is? You know, these amazing feats happening, which we saw in our last conversation that Jesus is fulfilling the prophecies and John is fulfilling the prophecies pointing to Jesus. Ministry continues And then in verse 14 of Matthew 14, after Jesus withdraws privately to a solitary place where he could be by himself, obviously to grieve, when Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. And I just think how John's martyrdom (laughs) 
continues to point to Jesus as well. It, it did always. You know, it's like the crowds gather, the crowds follow him. I mean, if you read it, Jesus heard what had happened. He withdrew. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. Even John's martyrdom pointed the crowds to Jesus. It's like, well, where is our hope? If this can happen, who is our Messiah? Maybe everything John said was true. Even in his martyrdom, even in his death, John is pointing to Jesus. Yeah, even in John's death, God was still setting John apart for his special purpose, one that truly made him great, one that from womb to tomb pointed to the true great one, Jesus. He must become more while we become less. That's a countercultural way of thinking about our lives. It was then and it is now. And so we'll conclude this study in just a moment by focusing on that great quote from John talking about his relationship to Jesus. He must increase, I must decrease. And how that is at the center of this living a life that points to Jesus. We'll do that after a word about where we'll be studying together next in our podcast. Next time on the Discover the Word podcast, Rasul Berry is back at the table with the group to lead a study called Hope Fully. Well, I'm excited to get into this conversation with you all about a word in the Bible that is pretty small in size, but very large in significance. Hmm. And it's hope. Hmm. I think that just with a lot that's been going on in our world over the last several years, I think it's an increasingly important word in my own spiritual journey. And my hope (laughs) for this time (laughs) together is that it will deepen our sense of confidence and see why it's such an important theme. And the thing that's interesting about hope is that it shines the brightest when it's needed the most. Hmm. Yeah, discover what they mean by that in a study called Hope Fully, next time on the Discover the Word podcast. And now let's conclude our look at the life of John by talking about how this counterintuitive perspective of John the Baptist, of the way up is the way down, he must increase, I must decrease, how that really is a key of living a life that points to Jesus. This has been a long conversation, many conversations threaded together by one main idea, which is John the Baptist lived a life that pointed to Jesus. Mm -hmm. We've already looked at nine different roles that he occupied, and I'm wondering if any one has lingered with you through our conversations. And I'll go first while you think about it. I'll just whip them off. Chosen child, unique man, forerunner, baptizer, prophet, witness, attendant, questioner, and martyr. Mm-hmm. And the one that's popped me has popped me a long time, and it's the attendant one. Because I think John's words are so stunning when he says, I must become less and he must become greater. And he uses that wedding metaphor of how Jesus is the bridegroom and the role of the best man is to protect that union. Mm-hmm. And I, it's a little bit heroic in a way, mm-hmm. But the way it's accomplished is counterintuitive because it's by diminishing yourself. Yeah. I must become less, he must become greater. And yeah. I think it's a great life goal. So, so that part, at least it really goes to the heart. John got it, didn't he? Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. got his role, mm-hmm. even though all kinds of other questions were raised in the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think for me, of the roles that you asked us to think about, which one stuck with me the most, I actually think the one that stuck with me the most was the first one, that he was a chosen child. Mm. Mm. Because I've studied John's life and work, but I'm not sure that I really appreciated until that conversation the degree to which before birth, Mm. John was chosen for this purpose. Mm. In a sense, he came to the earth on a very, very specific mission that was unique to any other person who had ever lived. And he didn't choose it for himself. No, he didn't get a vote. <laughs> he, he, just, he just got a job. It takes you back to Psalm 139 about being knit together in your mother's womb. And, you know, yeah. before you utter a word, you know, already God knows what we're thinking. There's just a, such a divine calling mm-hmm. in it. That's right. And we get to see it because of the stories of Zechariah and Elizabeth that, that Luke tells us. Yeah, we and, get to see that. And it's interesting, your, your point about this psalm, when we read the story, 
John actually responds to Jesus while he is still in know, the womb. When the, the, uh-huh. In the womb, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he starts his doing his job tummy. before he's even right. born. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Hmm. I think for me, the one that jumps out is questioner. Hmm. And I would nuance that and say that on the first question, he's a questioner. On the second question, he seems more of a doubter. And that role of doubter is encouraging to me Mm. because I feel like I live a lot of my Mm. life in that space. The first question was, shouldn't you baptize me? And the second question... Are you actually the one? Mm -hmm. He had spent time with Jesus. He was there when this miraculous moment of the heavens opening up and a dove descending on Jesus and a voice from heaven saying, this is my son whom I love and him I am well Mm -hmm. pleased. He was there for all that. Mm -hmm. And yet when he ends up in a really tough spot, in fact, it's the prison that he'll lose his life in. Mm -hmm. He asks some hard questions and doubts and wonders if he's missed it his whole life. And that's just really encouraging to me. Mm. I, I think that last thing that you said, Daniel, goes back to what I was saying about the chosen child thing. I mean, it's not enough to think, what if I got it wrong? It's my whole life has been about this. What if I got it wrong? Yeah. Yeah. And my mm-hmm. whole life has been wrong. My whole life of decreasing that he might increase. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you talked wrong. about it being a mission yeah. statement, yeah. The way you've expressed that, Bill, is what leads me to land on the idea of him being a witness. Uh-huh. His whole life, he was given something. Yeah. He didn't come up with himself. Mm-hmm. Right. Either maybe his mother or father told him something about you know, what they had experienced. And then he indicates that the Spirit actually told him things. And then all he's doing is just saying, this is my story. This is, this is what I've heard, mm. that Jesus is the mm. Christ and he must increase and I must decrease. But it all, as you pointed out in our, our last conversation, even in his death, it all turned out to be about Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because now that he was gone, the crowds went to Jesus. Mm-hmm. They weren't divided in their, their attention anymore. So in so many different ways, he was just telling what he had seen about yeah. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A witness. Yeah. Well, there's one more role, and I find it surprising yet again. It's a powerful statement that Jesus makes about him, and I'm going to call the role Great One. Mm. Let's read this passage from Matthew 11, verses 7 to 19. Luke also contains some words about this in his gospel, but let's go around the table. Daniel, would you start us off? Matthew 11, verse 7 to 19. Sure. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. And then in verse 11, here's the pop. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Yeah, even in the moment where he increases, he still decreases at the same time. <laughs> it's interesting that that's the language Jesus uses here. Mm-hmm. Okay, then in verse 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. And he goes on, whoever has ears, let them hear. And he talks then in verse 18, John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. What do we make of that? It's a dense passage. Mm, it's very yeah. dense. Yeah, so much. It's very dense. Well, I mean, the part of it that's not dense is mm-hmm. the part where he calls out the criticism of the religious leaders yeah. again. They're talking out of both sides of their mouth. They're criticizing mm-hmm. John for one thing. Right because of what he's not doing, and then they criticize Jesus for doing what John was not doing. So mm-hmm. You can't have it both ways. And, and this particular section that I just picked out here is actually following what we just talked about in a couple of conversations ago about who 
John actually was and who Jesus was and all the fulfillment of the prophecies that Jesus yeah. provided by his life that we read from the Old Testament. So that's when Jesus says this is who John is. Can you imagine being called the greatest? I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Just that statement. Could that be referring to his role? That's what I, I was so. wondering. Yeah. I yeah, think it's by greater in what way otherwise. Yeah. yeah. He wasn't the greatest in money no. <laughs> or mm-hmm. power or even influence. No. So what made him greater? Mm-hmm. It must have been this very specialized role that we've talked about that he had that was different than even the other prophets that had come yeah. before him. Yeah. I agree the, with that. The, the tight yeah. connection to Jesus. Yeah. 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 I think what's really interesting, Elisa, is in this Matthew 11 passage you had us in, we talked about the death of John pointing to Jesus because the people who perhaps were still following him would turn and follow Jesus. It's at the very end of this chapter that Jesus gives the great invitation, come to me, Hmm. all who labor Hmm. and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Not just to the followers of John, but to everyone, he issues this most wonderful invitation Mm. to come to him Mm. and let him fill the empty spaces in their lives. Mm. And as you said, Mark, it's dense, but it's like Jesus is knitting together a group of people who aren't satisfied with anything, you Mm -hmm. know, like bratty children, you know, we played the pipe for you and you did not Mm -hmm. dance. Mm -hmm. These strange words. He's like knitting that together with the purity of simple belief, you know, that John was called to trust a new way that Jesus was going to fulfill. I hope that these 10 conversations and these roles of a man we've known only as John the Baptist typically (laughs) in scripture has fleshed him out in, in ways that we relate to. Thank you for sharing your personal connections to it. John is the chosen child, a unique man, a forerunner, a baptizer, even of Jesus, a prophet, a witness, an attendant, a questioner, and a martyr in all of these roles, pointing to Jesus in such a way that Jesus actually highlights him as the great one. And that's something we can all take away in terms of understanding that when we are less, when we are least, he is great, he is greatest. That's our ultimate role, one that John modeled really well for us. So in all those roles and purposes we've talked about for these two episodes, the common denominator in everything about John the Baptist's life was that he, Jesus, must increase, I must decrease. John's life was all about pointing to Jesus. And what a great challenge that is for each of us, that whatever roles we find ourselves in, our best life is to live a life that points to Jesus so that Jesus will always become more while we become less. Well, you've been listening to the Discover the Word podcast. Thanks for joining Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Mark DeHaan around the table for this two-part dive into the life of John the Baptist. Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Well, I hope that you'll be part of our next study because that study is about hope. And we'll save a spot at the table for you so you can study with Rasul Berry, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day. Yeah, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.